I'm Naya, mom, boob nerd, board-certified lactation consultant, and lover of lipstick and curse words. I'm that weird Indian girl you knew in high school, all grown up. And I'm Alexis, mom, birth nerd, and therapist plus doula, encouraging parents to hold joy plus what the fuck is this mess simultaneously. Some people think I'm too much, but those aren't my people. And And we we are the Top Top Knot Squad. TKS is a tiny little podcast about motherhood in real life. The good, the bad, the ugly AF. Hosted by two women that are passionate about our beliefs and unafraid to speak our minds. Friends that wanted to create space for all that ish we are too scared to talk about. Are you ready to laugh, be vulnerable, and keep it real with us? Top knots are not required. If the Top Knot Squad content makes you laugh, not in agreement, or makes you feel less alone, we'd love your support in the cost of producing this podcast. Visit patreon.com slash topknotsquad to learn more about our budget-friendly sponsorship tiers and how you can help ensure that TKS has a future. Every little bit helps. This is part two of a two-part episode about our birth stories. We hope you enjoy it. How about you? How was your birth with Rory? Oof, it was a doozy. Yeah. Um... What is that? What's what's that word from? Doozy. Doozy? I'm not I, sure. I'm in this thing where I'll say, you know, words come out of me and I'm like, why do I say that word? Where does it come from? Yeah. That's another weird one. <laughs> I'm going to write that one down so we can look it up later. So I had planned a um, unmedicated birth, um, but it was planned at a hospital. We were in Dallas at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so... What hospital were you at? Harris Downtown, Fort Worth, or Texas Health Harris. Oh, Methodist you were in Fort downtown. Worth. Yeah, we were. We were, and we were at Baylor Frisco, so okay. we were actually north. We weren't in actual Dallas, but so we had planned a hospital birth, which I had. Um, I actually initially didn't have any opinion or thoughts. I originally saw a doctor at one of the main hospitals downtown, Mm -hmm. and she had just been, like, my gynecologist. And when we got pregnant, um, I just stuck with her. And it wasn't until I was, like, 20-something-ish weeks, like maybe 26 to 28 weeks. Ben actually, uh, his company watched – his company at the time watched Business of Being Born. Really? I was going to talk about that, too. Yeah. I don't remember why. I wish he was still in – watched it? Huh? His company or yes, his work that was how, like he knew about it and That's came home crazy. and told okay. me about this film. Like I just watched this. We had to watch this film. I don't remember why. I need to ask him like what happened. But he discovered the film, had watched it originally himself, mm-hmm. and then said, "You have to watch it." And that kind of started our journey of becoming more informed. So yeah. that film inspired See. you know us to read more. That was when we decided to mm-hmm. hire a doula. Our doula encouraged us to take a childbirth ed class. Mm -hmm. During childbirth ed class, I realized this doctor that was a lovely gynecologist was maybe not the best fit as an OB-GYN for me. Can I interrupt your birth? Yes. (laughs) Yes. Tell like a little backstory about it because it's pretty much the same as yours. (laughs) Um, This friend who came to the hospital with me or who sat at the hospital with me while I labored, she um, she decided to have a, a, a birth center birth for her first. And I was like, oh, man, she's brave. Knowing what I know now, I, I understand now that most women can have births like that out of mm-hmm. hospital births, especially if they're low risk. But um, she told me about business of being born. And I watched that. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this all makes so much sense. Mm-hmm. But as a first time mom, I still wasn't comfortable having an out, out of hospital birth because mm-hmm. – I just didn't. I yeah. couldn't. Um, that was I was just the my same. Thing. That was, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's like I want the kind of the, I'm going to put safety in quotes here, but the safety of being in a hospital just in case something goes horribly wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would want to be just wheeled into the OR instead mm-hmm. of waiting for uh, an ambulance or, or what have you. But, yeah, that same thing. The movie made us hire a doula. Um, and the doula, we talked to her about the the OB that I was with originally when I found out I was pregnant is not who I ended up delivering with. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a very nice man. And it's funny you mentioned the Christmas baby thing. When I told him my due date was Jan- – or when we figured out my due date was January 3rd, he's like, oh, just so you know, I'm off the last two weeks of January. So if ba- – or of December for the holidays. So if your baby comes a little early, you'll birth with one of my other associates. And uh. I'm like – Oh, okay. (laughs) And it was a practice of all men. And Mm. knowing what I know now, I know I'm more comfortable with a female provider there. Yeah. Um, And so 
we ended up switching to this group of nurse midwives when I was 28 weeks. So Mm -hmm. I was very late in my pregnancy. I wasn't even sure if they'd accept me as a a patient, but they did. And I think knowing that I had options and knowing to ask the right questions Mm -hmm. um, to my care provider and making sure that my needs were met as a consumer and as a birthing person, Mm -hmm. um, that movie really helped open up kind of that Pandora's box of oh, shit, there are options. I can do this a little bit differently. Yeah. Anyway. No, totally. That was, we were the same and it really opened our eyes and just had us exploring more and researching more and reading more and taking the class and hiring the doula and all that stuff. And um, I switched, I ended up switching doctors and I think I was over 30 weeks. So similarly, like, because by the time, because even when we watched the film, I didn't immediately say, oh, we have to switch doctors. Like, I still didn't have all the information. Mm -hmm. um, So I was still pretty ignorant. Um, But it wasn't until we, you know, the more information that we gathered, I was just like, "Uh, this is not a good match. And she actually, that doctor got really defensive because after one of our childbirth ed classes, we had kind of cultivated a list of questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And I remember I asked her, the question that I asked was, what is your cesarean rate? Like you, doctor, yourself, your cesarean rate. And she got so defensive. And she basically like went into this rant of, you know, I'm the doctor. I'm in charge. Like, I know it's best. Like, it was this whole thing. And I was like, well, we're going to find a different doctor. Like, yeah. in the moment, I said that to her because oh, I don't wow. – my personality type does not do well with that type of response. So it didn't even matter the subject matter. Mm-hmm. It was more of, like, how she spoke to me. Yes. Where I was like, yeah, this isn't going to work out. We're going to find a different doctor. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think it – because I was also worried about finding someone that would take us so late. Mm-hmm. But I love Dr. Mitchell was her name, which funny fact, one of my friends, Leslie, she's here in Austin. Um, We traveled. We were in Africa together for our internship. Her husband is our Dr. Mitchell's brother. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, small world. It's so weird. But I loved her and I wish that she were here in Austin because, you know, as we've been trying to have a third child, thinking about and planning for maybe having a third child. It's kind of crazy that I work in this field and I'm in this city and I don't really have a care provider that I'm like, that's the one yeah. or a birthing place that I'm like, that's the one. Mm-hmm. Austin actually, you know, could do some work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's known as a more progressive it's like, city. Yeah. Like a city that is more with it with Mm -hmm. stuff, which absolutely, if you look at stats for other places, they definitely offer a lot more. But me personally, I just don't like, I have not attended someone else's birth or met with someone else where I'm like, that's the one, Mm -hmm. which is kind of terrifying. But if Dr. Mitchell were here, I would, she would be my doctor. Just go back to Frisco and have a car baby. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Then we'd have a car baby for sure. <laughs> yes. You um, but anyways, sorry, that was kind of a long tangent. But uh, so we had planned unmedicated birth and I um, was way overdue. So I definitely fit the first time mom, you're going to be overdue. I think I, I was 41 weeks in like a couple days. Mm-hmm. And I remember that I, I ended work at 40 weeks exactly so I literally was like twiddling my thumbs right. for a whole week and was dying like yes. why did I do this the I last have gone few, to work. <laughs> everybody knows the last few weeks of pregnancy last about three years yes that's what it felt like so I was like why did I do this I should have stayed at work but I was also miserable there so that wouldn't have helped but um anyways I finally uh, I remember we had a couple like false alarms because I didn't really know what a contraction was mm-hmm. or what <laughs> and, it felt like. Yes. Yeah. So there were a couple times where I thought things had started and then it was like, no, those are Braxton, Braxton Hicks. And then um, it was I remember vividly because Ben had a friend over and he was like overstaying his welcome. And I was like <laughs> in the room And I was just in my head, I was like, okay, I know that these are not Braxton Hicks. Like Mm -hmm. these can't be. This is different from all the other Mm -hmm. times. Why is this dude in my living room? Like, and I was texting Ben, like, get him the fuck out of the house. Like, I think I'm in labor. (laughs) Yeah. And so we ended up calling our doula and she, you know, as most good doulas will tell you, was like, you know, if this is truly early labor, like take a bath, Mm -hmm. go to sleep. (laughs) Because this was at like 9 p.m. at night. 
Um, And so she was like, don't, you know, I know this is exciting, but you need to rest as much as you can in early labor. Mm -hmm. Um, I did not do a good job of listening to her. Um, It was hard for me to sleep because I was just so anxious. Yeah. And so the whole night went by and I just kind of stayed in the same pattern. They were, they were probably like, 10 minutes apart, my contractions. Mm-hmm. Um, I could definitely talk through them and move around. And we, so we spent that whole next day, it kind of stayed in that pattern. And I remember us like watching movies. We went for a walk around the neighborhood and I just wasn't, it wasn't picking up. Mm-hmm. I was just steady contractions every eight to 10 minutes. Um, and again, they weren't intense enough where I had to like stop what I was doing. So that was day one. My entire labor was with Rory was like 55 hours. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that was day one. And it's definitely fuzzy. But I remember somewhere in there, they slowed down even more. So mm-hmm. they kind of went away. And we were doing like phone support with our doula. And then they picked back up again. So you know, looking back at it, I'm pretty sure I had padromal labor Mm -hmm. is what was happening. Yeah. Um, And he also was uh, sunny side up. So I think that definitely had something to do with it. All stuff that I didn't know then that I know now (laughs) looking back. Um, But uh, the next day, you know, they kind of stopped. I remember we slept and then they picked back up again the next day. Uh, And this time they like increased in intensity. They were a good four to five minutes apart consistently. Oh, wow. I couldn't talk through contractions. Mm -hmm. And so Ben like called our doula to come. She came to our house actually. She like just from assessing me and how I was managing the contractions and like her tracking them, how close together they were, she suggested we go to the hospital. And so we went to the hospital the first time. (laughs) We went to the hospital multiple times with him. And they checked me. They wanted to check me. And I was nothing. Oh, no. Like, my cervix was hard and closed. (laughs) (laughs) So um, that was pretty terrible to hear. Yeah. Having been two days now of contractions and then this last day of these, like, consistent active labor pattern. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was a lot of work for me to, you know, handle them. And so they gave me the option of I could either stay at the hospital and we could, you know, keep moving through the contractions and see what happened. Or they could send me home with an Ambien. Maybe that's not what they gave me. No, that's probably what they asked. Okay, Ambien. (laughs) Um, They could send me home with an Ambien and I could try to sleep. Mm -hmm. Or they could give me help um, with Pitocin. And so I decided to go home. And took the Ambien, which I hated because that contraction pattern continued. So I was still in an active labor pattern, but now I was loopy and on drugs. Right. Um, So that makes everything worse because you don't know what the hell's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of was in and out of sleep. It was it was a terrible night, and I think my doula like left for she went to like sleep at a friend's house for a while, and so. The next morning, <laughs> uh, she the doula came back over and she kind of like assessed and was like, "Okay, look, like I want to try some wacky things, and this will hopefully like get things moving." So we did all the wacky positions, like she did side lying release. She did the um, what's that one called? Webster? No, is that what it's called? No. What's it called? Webster's like the certification that chiropractors need to have. It starts with a W. I'm a doula and should know this. Um, <laughs> all my doula friends that are listening, I cannot think of what the W position is. But like you lay, like I basically laid on my kitchen counter and your legs are like dangling over. Do you yeah. know what I'm talking I've about? I've seen pictures of, of like women in labor. In oh, that my position. God. My brain isn't working. It's not Wexler, is it? No, that might be it. Okay. Whatever. That position. We did all the wacky positions um, to try to get baby in a better position. Mm-hmm. Um And I hated my doula through all of it because it was awful. Because, again, I was still in this active labor pattern. The contractions were painful, Mm -hmm. and I couldn't really focus. I was also sleep-deprived now at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, But she was just really pushing me to try anything and everything to try to get him in an optimal position so that things would get moving. 
Um, and so we did all these wacky things. And then we also went to the chiropractor and she did an adjustment. And when that happened, I thought my water broke, like something happened down there. And I was like, oh, my God, my water broke. I think it was my mucus plug. Uh-huh. Um But then when we got home, things did pick up. So they got a little bit closer together. They were way more intense. I started throwing up. And so my doula, (laughs) I think she thought I was in transition at that point. Um, And so she was like mad dash, like, we got to go. We got to get to the hospital. We go to the hospital for the second time. And I was one centimeter. (laughs) That's so disheartening (laughs) to hear. Yeah. So that was terrible. At that point, we had, um, Ben and I had, like, made this plan with each other of if I asked for the epidural, he would leave the, he would be like, okay, I'm going to go talk to a nurse. And so he would, like, tell me that he was going to do that, but not really go get anyone to get me an epidural. Mm -hmm. And so when we were there, I was, like, sobbing. It was bad. Like, I'm pretty sure Ben was crying, too. Like, everybody was crying. Everyone Mm -hmm. was tired. It was terrible. And I was like, I I just want the epidural. Like, I can't do this anymore. And he was like, okay. And I could tell that he was, like, going to just go do our plan. But I was like, if you don't really fucking ask for the epidural, mm-hmm. I will, like, slit your throat. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, like, pretty sternly and firmly was like, I know this was the plan, but the plan is out the window. Mm-hmm. You need to get me an epidural. And I actually, my doula wrote like a timeline. And I remember in the timeline, she said that when Ben went to go ask for the epidural, he was so emotional. Like when he went to go get the nurse, like my wife wants an epidural, like he couldn't say the words. Like he was, and so she had to like help, like say, you know, come talk to her. I think she wants an epidural, Mm -hmm. but he was just so emotional. He couldn't get the words out. Yeah. So anyways, I ended up getting the epidural They also ended up giving me Pitocin. I don't remember if that automatically happened or if it happened later on. It's all fuzzy. You know, three days of no sleeping does that. But basically, the epidural was what I needed. And I slept for, I don't even know how long, but it was a good amount of sleep. It was probably like five or six hours Mm -hmm. that we slept. And I woke up and I was complete. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So. um, That's all your body needed to do was just relax. Yeah. So um, when we hear, when we get to Rowan's story, um, I'll talk a little bit about in the moment of all of this, Mm -hmm. I had no idea. I'm a sexual assault survivor. Um, The cervical checks and a lot of what was happening in the hospital was incredibly triggering for Mm -hmm. me. And I know now looking back that that is what my body was basically like. I mean, sure, he was probably not in optimal position, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I also think my body was just it couldn't relax. It was tense. It was holding on to protect me because I didn't feel safe. Right. And so the epidural was a wonderful tool, which is something, you know, that's become a passion of mine as I I. I really, I've kind of marketed that I work specifically with trauma survivors, not only as a therapist, but as a doula. Mm -hmm. Um, And as a doula, that's a a big thing for me is that if you have a trauma history, there might be some interventions that are going to be what you need and that's okay. And let's talk about what that is, Yes, you know? And so for me, that the epidural provided safety and it allowed my body to open and have him. Um, I did push for like two hours, <laughs> so it wasn't a short amount of pushing. Um, and he had the worst cone head because he was in that funky position. Yes. Uh, and the long amount of pushing. But he finally got there. Fi- I think it was like 55 hours total. Wow. You from, yeah. are a warrior. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> so that's, that's Rory. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. That just goes to show you how different first-time births can be from mom to mom. Right? Right? (laughs) A really long one? Hopefully, uh, the majority of first-time moms, though, are somewhere in the middle. Yeah, in between (laughs) both of ours. Ours are both pretty far each extreme. (laughs) We're on either end of the bell curve there. Hopefully, you are right in the middle. Why don't you tell your birth story with Rowan? I know we're running low on time. Sorry. Oh, you're fine. I, this could be a little bit longer episode. Yeah. Um, it's hard not to tell birth stories without lots of detail. Yes. Uh, there is, I think it's Penny Simkin did some type of study about 
Like she, it, I think it was they asked women. I'm going to say this really wrong, but I'm going to look it up and we'll put it in the show notes. Mm-hmm. But basically, they like asked women um, right after birth, um, like what they remember and recall from the birth, and then they asked them again like 20 years later or something, and they remembered the same stuff. No way. Yeah. So I need to look it up. Don't quote me right now. Okay. I need to look it up. But okay. I might have Check said the that show wrong. Notes. But it was something really powerful like that. Like it's, this is a huge day for us as women and we remember the details. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, um, and not necessarily like, like when I was telling Rory's story, like there's lots of missing pieces in that. But mm-hmm. like I vividly remember the parts I remember. Right. You and know, you remember the feelings that you were feeling. Exactly. That time too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyways, uh, knowing that Rory's birth was as difficult as it was, um, I had a pretty hard postpartum after that with him. Uh, I did a lot of stuff to try to make the second time around different. So I educated myself even more and I made more of a plan. We were in Austin at the time. So we moved actually when I was about six months pregnant with Mm -hmm. Rowan. And I similarly had to like find all new providers, um, a new doula, all of that. We had planned a birth center birth. And I was very worried. My Dr. Mitchell that I praised Mm -hmm. (laughs) in Dallas, she was like a one woman show, which is uh, really rare. That is very rare. Um, So she like she's who delivered like she had backup, but it was her like she delivered her clients babies. Um, That's amazing. I know. And which I understand why group practices exist. It's like, so like you can't, they can't do everything. They're, mm-hmm. they're still human. They need a break and it allows them to have time for their families and themselves yes. and for their to be rest for providers. We need that. But at the same time, especially with my trauma history, it was important to me to like know who was going to be there. Mm-hmm. And so I remember when we went to the birth center, like that was one of my initial really big things was one, I need to meet everyone and I need them all to know my story and know my needs um, so that no matter who it is, I'll be okay Mm -hmm. because I know who it is. And then my other thing was if I get transferred, I need to know exactly like we need the like super backup plan and I need to know exactly what's going to happen. At the time, this was Austin Area Birthing Center. At the time, they told, I know this is not true anymore, or I don't even know that it ever was true. I'm not really sure, but we got bad information. At the time, they told us that they had a partnership with Seton and that if there needed to be a transfer, we would go to Seton. And this was if it weren't an emergency. So the number one reason for transfer is maternal exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So they're like, if a situation like that happens, it's not an emergency. The midwife can go with you. The midwife can still deliver your doctor at Seton. Our midwives have rights at Seton. Which now that I work in the birth world, Mm -hmm. people look at me like I'm crazy when I say this. They're like, that never happened. Like, that's not a real thing. Yeah. So I don't really know what happened with us getting information, but I just know that that's the information we were given. And so that gave me tremendous relief because I was just like, okay, so if we need a transfer and then also just knowing they were like, you know, we have a relationship with these doctors. So if it is an emergency, it would be one of these doctors that we know, yada, yada, whatever. Anyways, so I was very naive and took that as this is a wonderful backup plan. So I also um, everyone told me every birth is different. This birth will be different. It was different, but it was also very similar. So the main difference was my water broke to start my labor. So um, and it was like in the movies. So it was not that's not typical. Mm -hmm. So the movies actually do us a disservice because everyone thinks there's a big gush and then like immediately you have contractions and a baby. And that's not really the case all the time. But my water broke with a big gush like all over my bathroom. Um, I was kind of hoping you were out somewhere in public, like we at weren't. a restaurant or Target we or something. I did start ha- – we did – went to go see Planet of the Apes at the movie theater. Mm-hmm. And I started having contractions oh, no during the movie. And I told Ben, like, we need to leave. And it was then when we got home that my water broke. Oh, good thinking. So it could have happened, happened if I didn't ask to leave. But after my water broke, my contractions completely stopped. 
So that kind of mimicked, like it was bringing me back to my first birth when Mm -hmm. that happened. Like I was like, oh my gosh, no, this can't happen again because it was like they started and then slowed down. Um, And so I was really discouraged. The birth center ended up wanting us to come in to confirm that my waters had broke, which I was actually really annoyed by. I would be too. Because I was like, no, I know this was my water. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, But they made us come in and did the test, and sure enough, my waters had broke. Well, anyways, they put me on a time clock. So, which, again, at a birth center, I didn't really expect that to happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were only going to give me 24 hours. So they told us to go home and to rest and to see what would happen in the morning. Because this was at, like, 11 p.m. when my water broke. So it was late at night. And we went to the birth center at like midnight and then got back and they were like, just go home, sleep, and we'll check back in in the morning Mm -hmm. and see what's happening. So nothing really was happening. So since we were on a time clock, they had me come in to try to induce. So they were giving me all these tinctures. They had been do nipple stimulation. I don't think we ever ended up using the pump, but I remember them pulling it out. We were maybe going to use the pump. Um, and so I ended up getting into an active labor pattern. So it was a few hours, but I like gradually, everything started to increase. Um, and very similar to Rory, I got into this like every four to five minutes. Mm -hmm. They were pretty intense. I couldn't talk. I had to really focus. And the, I also, so I kind of like had bad luck with everything in her birth. So the midwife that was there when we went in that day, she was brand new. Um, Uh And so, well, not brand new, but she was newer to the group. And one, I think her training was not as, um, she might have been a nurse midwife. I I don't really remember, but... Basically, I felt more like I was in the hospital with her. Okay. Than more I medically did. minded, maybe. Yes. Yeah. So she was wanting to check me, and I and I hadn't met her. So this was like another yeah. instance where like I, I didn't it's meet her till that day. Mm-hmm. She was wanting to check me, and it was just an ordeal. So she ended up checking me, and I want to say I was I was like two or three centimeters. So that definitely was different than Rory, but it was still not much. Right. And knowing that I was on this time clock, it was just really disheartening, like, because she was pretty also adamant of, like, we really need to watch the clock. And as we're getting closer to 24 hours, my recommendation is that we go to the hospital. Um, so that probably didn't help matters because I just had that in the back of my mind. Yeah. And so anyways, we kept laboring. It was hard. Like, I was, it was really hard to get through the contractions. And so we approached the 24-hour time mark, and she wanted to check me again. It was completely traumatic, um, and I w- there was no change. So when she checked me, I was still only two centimeters, two or three centimeters. I don't remember. And I'm pretty sure I had a panic attack. Um, so that the birth center had nitrous oxide, mm-hmm. and I ended up using nitrous oxide in that moment. But uh, it didn't necessarily because I was still having an active labor pattern and I was still in tremendous pain managing these contractions. And I I just lost it. And I was like outside of my body like I could that that was like what it felt like. Like I felt like I could see myself and I was not a part of my body. I was not there. Um, And so they gave me the nitrous oxide and that essentially grounded me enough to like have a coherent conversation and she she was recommending that we go to St. David's instead of Seton. Of course, in in the moment, like you don't really have time to like argue that. So right. in my head, I, in my head, I remember thinking like, why the fuck are we going to St. David's? Like we're supposed to go to Seton. Mm-hmm. And so that was a cluster. But apparently, since she was newer, she had not be- attended a birth at Seton, and she had only ever been to St. David's, and she felt more comfortable with who the providers might be there. Okay. So we go to St. David's and they thought we were like crazy town coming up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. The provider that happened to be the doctor on call was new to Austin. Oh, no. Um, So my transplants. Yeah. So my midwife didn't know her. My doula didn't know her. I didn't know her. 
And she just thought we were these crazy people that, you know, were doing dangerous things by not coming to the hospital to begin with. Like that was kind of how she was treating us. Um, But definitely when we got there, things the I remember the car ride there was terrible. Oh, I bet. And when we got there, like things were picking up, like even though all of this was happening, like things started progressing even further because once we got to the hospital, I ended up getting the epidural, but pretty soon after getting the epidural, I, it, I was complete. So I'm pretty sure that somewhere in there, my body started to kind of work things out, mm-hmm. but I didn't, I wasn't given the time to get there. Right. That's what I think now looking back, but I ended up getting the epidural and I remember actually they wanted to do the IV and they wanted me to get in the bed similar to what you were saying. And I pretty much flat out told them no. So I was standing on like, I was like, I'll stand right here. And I had like my arms out and I was like, but I'm not getting in the fucking bed. Mm -hmm. And so they just all hated me. I was non-compliant. Right. Um, And I kept telling them no. Like when she wanted to put the monitors on, I was like, don't touch me. (laughs) It was like all this stuff. Um, And so I was fighting with them the whole time and they all hated me and they all treated me like shit because I was so non-compliant, which is not okay, by the way. (laughs) No matter how non-compliant I was. And so anyways, I ended up getting the epidural and this nurse was done with me and everyone went to go rest and settle, but I couldn't sleep and I was feeling tremendous pressure. And I was just like, I feel like something's happening. And I like paged her and was like, I need you to come check me. Like, I think maybe the baby's coming. And she was like, no, we just got you set up. It's probably just your catheter. Like still come check. You you. need to, you need to get some rest. Like that was what she told me. And I was like, no motherfucker, come fucking check me. I'm telling you that something is going on. And she was like, so exasperated with me. Um, And so when she came in there, like she literally like pulled the sheet back and was like, oh my God. And then like panic mode. Cause she was essentially, I think I was crowning. Like she was basically there. Yeah. Um, And so everybody woke up from their short nap um, <laughs> hated you even more <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah and then she and I didn't push as long that time either so and it was different to that time because I even though they had just placed the epidural it was at the lowest dose and I was just feeling so much more than I remembered feeling with Rory like I remember I struggled with pushing with Rory mm-hmm. because I couldn't you feel anything count. yeah I I, I could, couldn't even tell when I was having a contraction but I was feeling so much pressure down there and I my body was automatically wanting to push and so I don't remember how long it was but she came pretty quickly we also didn't find out the sex of either of them um and Ben funny story I think I may have told this on another podcast but he he wanted to announce the sex and the umbilical cord was in the way and so when he went to he was like it's a it's a like he couldn't tell (laughs) and then he was like it's a girl (laughs) <laughs> he loves her I know <laughs> but it was very funny that's really funny so anyways we're probably way over time I know but but we that's... wanted to share our birth stories with you guys yeah. we know that we're two birth and postpartum professionals and we do we talk we hint a lot about birth but we haven't shared our stories and I'm we're both hoping that by listening to these stories you kind of understand a little bit more about what fuels us and what uh, helps us achieve our goals professionally, definitely on a personal level too. Yeah. If the Top Knot Squad's content makes you laugh, not in agreement, or makes you feel less alone, we'd love your support in the cost of producing this podcast. Visit patreon.com slash Squad to learn more about our budget-friendly sponsorship tiers and how you can help ensure that TKS has a future. Every little bit helps. If you like what you hear, then be sure to click the subscribe button in your podcast app. While you're there, leave us a review. You can find us on social media. Just search for Top Knot Squad. We welcome your feedback and love making new friends.